I fear that even with the unwitting aid of Ms. Walker, I still cannot completely control the machines in the Starlet Sanctuary. I believe they sent us to the correct arc, but I was unable to control precisely where we arrived on it. Alas, that means the location I saw in the Sanctuary is beyond my reach for the time being, along with the molten Edmundium I saw there. Ah, oh, confound it all. Naturally, I cannot confirm that molten substance was indeed Edmundium until I have inspected it with my own eyes, but it simply must be. It looked exactly like my samples did when I attempted to melt them down. Imagine, an entire cavern of the most potent element known to man. The wonders I can create. While the Molten Edmundium remains elusive, this underground forest has proven quite illuminating, both figuratively and literally. Many of this cavern's species are bioluminescent, so out of curiosity, I dissected several of the glowing insects that are common here. After further study, I have concluded that the luminescent fluid found in their posteriors carries something akin to a bioelectric charge. However, I cannot determine how it is generated, and with no place to store it, said charge fades quickly. Curious, curious indeed. What could be the cause of this? With no sunlight to provide the forest with energy, perhaps this charge comes from the soil? Yes, yes, of course! The Edmundium is the cause! If there were truly molten pools of Edmundium somewhere in these caverns, then Edmundium minerals would have spread throughout the soil over time, allowing its wondrous properties to affect nearby flora and fauna. Even if it is not the direct source of the charge found in this forest's bioluminescent wildlife, it may have incited incremental changes in those species over several generations, which then led to their development of an internal charge. Oh, how invigorating! I could be standing in the middle of an entire ecosystem that has been absorbing the effects of Edmundium for generations, and all of its secrets are mine for the taking. Oh, magnificent! Bloody hell, this place is weird. Don't get me wrong, it's fascinating too. Such an abundance of underground flora is completely unheard of. And because so many of the plants here are bioluminescent, the whole forest has an eerie beauty to it. That's just it though. Eerie is the operative word. I've been holding my rifle so tightly since we got here that I swear I've left dents in the grip. We should have gone back to the island. People know us there. They might have offered help and supplies. Rockwell didn't want to hear that though and I wasn't about to let him come here alone. You can't surprise me anymore, life, I said. After wyverns, golems, and giant sandworms, I'm ready for anything. What about flying squid bat murder monsters? Life replied. Well, that is mildly surprising, I conceded. By which I mean, I shot and cursed at those things all afternoon. At least when I wasn't running from them. Thankfully, after thinning their numbers a little, they decided that Rockwell and I weren't worth the trouble. Let's hope they don't change their minds. I'm not sure if I have enough ammunition to fend them off again. And yes, I know that FSBMM isn't the most scientific of monikers, but I'm bloody upset with them right now, so that's what I'm calling them. Along with some other names I'd rather not write down. While I can't say I'm enamoured with this station's wildlife, I'm certainly grateful for its abundance of natural resources, particularly water. The permeability of the rocks here is astounding. The cavern walls are wet with condensation, and the floor is littered with pools of water. After all that time in the desert, 
This is one change I can welcome with open arms. Thank God for hydration. I don't mean that just for my sake either. Rockwell seems distracted. The other day, I had to keep him from walking headlong into a carnivorous plant. He wouldn't fare well in a harsher environment. Then again, at his age, I'm sure I'd lose a step too. There's no mistaking it. That was a giant armored mole rat. Thankfully, it wasn't aggressive, so I was able to get a good look at it. Its appearance made me realize something that I'd taken for granted. Every creature I've encountered has some basis on either a known species or human legend. Golems and wyverns never existed on Earth, but humans did write stories about them. Even the FSBMMs, still cross with them, appear to be a pastiche of known fauna. What does this mean? Are the curators of these stations human? Do they merely possess the extensive knowledge of humans? Or am I grasping at straws? I can't say, but it's worth pondering. I must admit, I'm glad that I coerced Miss Walker into accompanying me. Her scientific mind may be far below my own, but she can fire a rifle proficiently enough. I suppose that is no surprise. She is a colonial after all, and she never has been terribly ladylike. I hadn't noticed what a foul mouth she has either. Dreadful! However, despite her past deceptions and uncouth vulgarity, I must tolerate her presence for now. The predators here are not to be trifled with. Of course, in my youth, I could have grappled them into submission. Why, I would simply pin their wings behind their backs and drive them to the ground. Yes, I'd give them a truly thorough thrashing. Ah, to be young again. The FSBMMs returned, and I was right. I didn't have the firepower to fight them. Luckily, someone else did. It was incredible. I've never seen a human move that fast. One second, I'm a dead woman. And the next, there's someone in glowing silver armor tearing through those creatures like they were dodos. One got punched so hard, it skipped off the cavern floor. As if a superhuman savior wasn't shocking enough, when they lifted their visor, I found a familiar face. It was Mei Yin. Hello? It took me a good minute to form a sentence after that. I must have looked like a complete dipstick because I swear she almost <laughs> laughed. At least I'm a living dipstick. And with her around, I might stay that way. What's the saying? Absence makes the heart grow fonder? On the island, I wasn't sure where I stood with Mei Yin, but now we've been catching up like best mates. She apologized for socking me in the face. I learned how she arrived here and that she got her new scar while battling Nerva to the death. You know, best mate things. She also introduced us to some of her tribe mates at her camp and here's where it gets loony. They're from the future. Well, my future anyway. It all fits, doesn't it? I've never met anyone from my future before, but Mei Yin and Rockwell are from my past and the technology here is beyond anything from my present. Clearly, the current year is far beyond 2008. But by how much? Ms. Walker, I can tolerate for now, but I cannot abide by this barbarian. I cannot fathom how she even lives, much less how she ended up here. A primitive mind like hers could never have operated the contraptions in the Starlet Sanctuary. Yet here she stands, and worst of all, she wears a suit of Edmundium armor! The very thing I seek has already been claimed by some savage, sword-welding tarts! It's outrageous. 
such a beautiful product of science should not be sullied by her blood-stained hands. No, Rockwell, you must be calm. If she senses hostility, she will surely kill you on the spot. Yes, for now, I must bide my time and learn what I can. Whoever constructed this armor, I must find them. The journey to the village was a bit tricky. Since Rockwell and I lack the high-tech armor the others wear, they had to help us along with rope ladders and zip lines. We made it eventually though, and it's quite the sight. The technology this tribe uses is incredible, although Rockwell was far more intrigued by it than I was. Mayan's friend, Diana, gave us the grand tour and he pelted her with questions the whole time. Fortunately, Diana just smiled and answered his questions patiently. Apparently, she was a pilot in her own time, which is the same era her fellow villagers are from. That there are so many people from one time period on one station seems unusual. I wonder what it means. Astounding! That remarkable armor was but the tip of the iceberg. The barbarian woman has escorted us to the home of her new masters, and I can take nary a step without finding some wondrous new piece of technology, much of it relying on the power of Edmundium. The casual manner in which they use and refer to these wonders leads me to believe that while they are deeply familiar with the marvelous metal, they may not grasp the depths of its potential. Yes, Rockwell, this was well worth tolerating Miss Walker and her savage companion. I shall learn what these supposed future men know, and take it many steps further. The village has a vast supply of Edmundium, far more than my own poultry samples. In this quantity, I can almost hear it singing to me as I study it. It pulses with energy at such an entrancing rhythm that it's hard to tear my eyes away from it. The villagers here refer to it as element. <sighs> Nonsense! Everything is an element. Do they simply forget to name it? I've also been learning what they know of the charge that is common in this place, which I made note of earlier. Their own studies confirm my suspicions that it is the result of the Edmundium that permeates the caverns. That makes it worth researching. Obtaining detailed information from these villagers is like drawing blood from a stone. The red-haired woman Diana has been pleasant enough in answering my queries, but she is no scientist. Her naivety makes that quite evident. I simply must convince these future men to place me onto one of their research teams. That's where I'll really gain some ground. Unfortunately, they seem rather skeptical of my scientific prowess. Bah! Ridiculous! I don't care what year they hail from. I am Sir Edmund Rockwell. A mind like my own only comes once a millennium. It should be their honor to have me amongst their ranks. The nerve of these people! I've never seen such arrogance and disrespect directed towards a worthy colleague. I finally convinced Diana to let me partake in the village's research and experiments, and I have been treated like an ignoramus. These so-called scientists dare to talk down to me. They dare to underestimate me. Fools, the lot of them. Well, I dare say I don't need them. Now that I have access to their facilities and supplies, I can research charge and endmundium just fine without their aid. Soon enough, my knowledge shall surpass their own. Then we shall see who is primitive. I have to convince them to stop. There's no way the station will allow this. This place would never allow anyone to master it. 
If it weren't for Raya's warning, I'd be ecstatic about what they were creating. A gateway that can help us escape the station and reach the planet below? It's brilliant, but the obelisk will kill everyone here before we can complete it, just like they destroyed the village Raya told me about. I'm sure of it. Bloody hell, I'm going to look like an absolute madwoman. I've barely settled in here, and I'm already coming to them with doomsday prophecies. I'll need to convince Mei Yin and Diana first. They're my best bet. <sighs> well, I think that was the best I could hope for. The tribe's leadership balked at the idea of dismantling the Gateway Project entirely, but they've at least agreed to put it on hold until we've gathered some data from the obelisks. Diana was a big help. She seems to hold a bit of sway where this project is concerned. However, on this station, getting to an obelisk is something of a risky proposition. To reach them, we'll need to make a trip to the surface, which Mei Yin says is dangerous. That means before I go, I'll need a crash course on that armor. Confound it all! Why am I progressing so slowly? These scientists are no more intelligent than I, yet they make continual progress while my own research continues to flounder. It's just a matter of experience, that's all it is. They're more familiar with their tools and they have more information at their disposal. Were I in their shoes, I would have finished that ridiculous project of theirs months ago. I must work harder to account for my handicap. I shall eat and sleep in the lab and allow for no distractions. Not until my so-called peers have learned to respect the name of Sir Edmund Rockwell. At last, success! I've finally been able to convert this charge into proper electricity. Subsequently, I used it to create not only a charge battery, but a lantern as well. It was a simple matter, really. It's baffling that these supposed scientists haven't managed it already. Based on their surprise when I showed them my new invention, my earlier supposition was correct. They've barely scratched the surface of charge in Edmundium's full potential. Soon enough, I'll have surpassed their understanding of both. Yet if they expect me to share the full fruits of my research with them, they are sadly mistaken. Those who doubt the genius of Sir Edmund Rockwell shall never reap its rewards. I have at last persuaded Diana to show me this grand project those bumbling scientists are working so hard on. I'm hardly impressed. If I had to guess, I would say that this gateway project is merely aping the transporter platforms present at the base of every obelisk, and crudely at that. Everyone is quite excited about it, the small-minded simpletons. Why are they so eager to leave this place, where the impossible is within reach? They speak of escaping as though this was some kind of prison, when in reality, it is a land full of unparalleled promise and possibility. Thank goodness this Diana woman is so agreeable. She seems to view me as her personal responsibility, and as a result, she has served my whims rather well. All I need to do is assume the guise of a kindly, curious old man and I can persuade her to see it in my every need. I've nearly convinced her to escort me to the lower caverns where Molten Edmundium is said to flow in abundance. Those caverns were the reason I came here in the first place, and I'm certain an excursion into their depths would yield invaluable insight. I need only push and prod just a bit more. Once I upgraded my charge lantern prototype to be vastly more portable and efficient, the village council could ignore my petitions no longer. I shall be accompanying an expedition to the lower caverns post haste. At last, I shall be able to observe Edmundium in its rawest, most natural state. Marvelous! I can hardly contain my excitement, though I must make an effort to. The barbarian woman has been glowering at me for days. I suspect if she could, she would watch my every move, and probably forbid Diana from speaking to me. Fortunately, Miss Walker has been distracting her with trivialities, but I must still be cautious. 
That savage will turn to violence on a whim, and I must not provoke her. My time in the desert may have given me some skill with firearms and helped me get fit, despite failing to give me washboard abs much to my chagrin. But I'm still no soldier. That was evident to anyone who saw me flailing around in the training yard these past few days. If it weren't for Mei Yin and Diana, I'd still be crashing my tech armor into rocks and tripping over myself like a drunken dodo. Plus, I always feel less silly when there's someone to laugh at my mistakes along with me. Fortunately, Mei Yin will be accompanying me to the obelisk, so this whole thing won't rest in my unsteady, armored hands. Thank God. Hey. Mei Yin and I set out yesterday, alongside a bespectacled computer expert named Santiago. He'll be the one to actually examine the obelisk. He claims that he can hack into its terminal. If it's preparing to unleash a surge of power, as I suspect, then he says he might be able to reroute it. Rockwell, for his part, is staying behind. He's been aiding the villagers' scientists in their studies since we arrived, and has become rather… engrossed. Every other sentence with him is about that bloody metal he named after himself. It's a bit troubling, but thankfully, Diana said she'd look after him. I can't spend time worrying after Rockwell now, though. The fate of that whole village might depend on this expedition. Focus up, Helena. Let's do this. Thankfully, it seems I shall get a reprieve from all those nasty glares I've been receiving. Ms. Walker has taken her pet barbarian with her on that fool's errand she's running to the obelisk. Good riddance to bad rubbish, I say. I didn't bother to learn all the details of Miss Walker's mission, but it seems clear to me now that the obelisks are a red herring. It is the Edmundium that matters, so if she and her violent little lackey want to play explorer, so be it. In the meantime, I shall journey into the heart of these caverns to conduct real science and make real progress. Excelsior! I cannot say that I enjoy wearing this bulky, inelegant suit, but Diana claims that its protection is necessary if we are to venture into the Edmundium Caverns, so I shall endure it as best I can. I suppose that means I shall have to find a way to think without stroking my beard. Regardless, I am glad to be off. The other scientists that are accompanying me are rather nervous about the whole affair citing monster attacks that plagued previous expeditions. Lily liver to the lot of them. Science is full of risks, and this is but one more. One that shall prove well worth it in the end. I have traveled the world and created countless scientific marvels, but never before have I seen a sight so beautiful. In its rawest form, the song of the Edmundium is even more enchanting. Had I the time, I would simply gaze at it for days. Sadly, I must make haste before the others realize what I already know. That within Edmundium is the potential for a new dawn for humanity. I can see it. I can feel it. I must be the one to unlock its secrets. Our fates are intertwined, this majestic metal and I. More data, Rockwell. You need more data. You're so very close. The structure of this space station must be vastly different from the others to allow for these massive caverns. Is that uncommon, or do many of the stations vary so radically from one another? I've only seen three. For all I know, they could come in all shapes and sizes. Speaking of different, Mei Yin's been fairly talkative since we left, at least for her. She'll still grow quiet sometimes, but instead of trying to burn me to death with invisible eye lasers, she stares into the distance and idly fiddles with her necklace. 
I think it depicts a plane or spaceship of some kind. I wonder where she got it. They weren't exaggerating when they said the surface was dangerous. Direct exposure to sunlight during the day will quickly burn a human to a crisp, even in this fancy armor. That means we have to adjust our sleep schedules and wait just below the surface until night falls. When it does, we'll make a mad dash for the obelisk, let Santiago get in as much work as he dares, then run our asses back to safety. Struth! I thought that bloody desert was diabolical, but this tops it for sure. Why couldn't we do something simple, like flee from a pack of ravenous Allosaurus or something? This life I lead, I swear. Santiago is still going over his readings from last night, but even without them, it seems clear that the obelisk was behaving oddly. It was pulsing wildly, and the ground beneath it received regular tremors, as if the whole station was on the verge of tearing itself apart. Mayin agrees, the obelisks on the island never behaved like this. If this obelisk goes off, it could mean Armageddon for every living thing here. Despite this, Santiago is insisting on analyzing his readings. The scientist in me is proud of his dedication to hard evidence, but the part of me that would rather not be obliterated by a mysterious high-tech space station really wishes he would hurry the hell up. The Gateway Project needs to be abandoned. There's no other way, is there? We shared our findings with the village by radio. Santiago's analysis confirmed what I suspected. The obelisks are highly unstable. They could be days away from reacting. However, Santiago raised a good point. Even if the Gateway Project is shut down, we can't say for sure that it would stabilize the obelisks. It may be too late to dissuade the station from destroying the village. The only way to ensure our survival is to shut down the obelisks themselves. According to Santiago, we can't do that from the obelisk platforms, but he may be able to manipulate said platforms into teleporting us somewhere we could. Specifically, into the heart of the station itself. It's a huge risk, but it may be the only hope we have. This isn't the first time I've hacked into an obelisk. And on the plus side, we're not bringing a bomb. So... That's always good. I've done it! They didn't think I could contain it, but once again, I've proven them to be a band of fools. At last, I've obtained samples of molten Edmundium in its raw, undiluted form. I must be judicious with it. I could only create two containment pods for collecting samples and I may not be able to convince the council to let me return to these caverns to gather a second batch. This will have to be enough. No matter. I've been making miracles with primitive supplies and dim-witted scientists for years. Any sample size at all is enough for Sir Edmund Rockwell. Now that I have returned to the village's laboratory, I have confirmed that raw molten Edmundium is far more potent than its solid, impure counterpart. Of course, I'm the only one that sees it. The close-minded lackwits here that dare to call themselves scientists refuse to get close to it. They claim it will make me sick. Rubbish! The Edmundium would never harm me. I can feel its warmth. I can hear it calling to me. It speaks not of danger, but of infinite potential. They're also painfully myopic. Their impure Edmundium may make for fine armor, but that is a mere fraction of its true power. They'll see soon enough. The villagers have been quite bothersome since I returned. It was interfering with my work. Diana kept checking in on me, claiming she was concerned but I saw through her lies. I see through them all. They simply want to benefit from my genius. 
Luckily, I was able to distract them with a side project of mine, what I call Plant Species Z. I was studying the effects of chard on various flora and stumbled upon a new species that can act as a bioluminescent sentry. They seemed to believe that this was the center of my research, and so I happily let my samples pass into their incompetent hands. It's a paltry sum to pay for some much needed peace and quiet. Now it is just me and my Edmundium, as it should be. I can't believe it! We actually made it. We're inside the station. There's a platform here that Santiago was able to lock onto. Perhaps it was used while the station was being built. The architecture here is similar to that of the control center I encountered before. A jagged cavern of metal, lit by an unearthly blue glow. There's a constant hum around us, likely from the power being sent to all areas of the station. Hopefully Santiago is able to find a map on that console he's been messing with. Then all we have to do is find a control room and shut down the obelisk. Simple, right? Right. As we made our way deeper into the station, we passed through a massive chamber. It was so vast that I couldn't see the bottom of it from the bridge we were on. Yet it was packed full. From wall to wall, it was filled with specimen tubes, each containing creatures, fetuses, or eggs. I knew from the holograms that I'd seen on the island's control center that each station created its own creatures, but I'd never seen where the process actually occurred. There were specimens for every creature that lived on the station. From dinosaurs, to huge alien looking monsters. I would have loved to get more data from the room's consoles, but you know, after reading that aloud, I think Mei Yin was right. That idea really does sound stupid and dangerous. Good call. I no longer need to worry about working with a limited sample size thanks to my genius. The solution was right in front of me the whole time. I merely needed to transform the village's supply of solid Edmundium into its liquid state, then rid it of impurities. It was easier said than done, of course, but I am Sir Edmund Rockwell. No problem is too complex and no task is too great for me. Nothing can keep me from my goal. Nothing can keep me from ascending. That is the true power of Edmundium. I see it now. It can take a living thing and change it. No, elevate it. Yes, yes, but I shall need to test it. <sighs> subjects, subjects. I shall need subjects. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The test went more splendidly than I could have imagined. I used one of the small glowing creatures that the villagers keep as pets for my first subject. It was a timid, fragile thing. That is until I injected a full dose of pure molten Edmundium into its veins. Then, as I predicted, it ascended. Within minutes, it grew in size and power until at last, it was a mighty, fearsome beast. Alas, that meant that Diana put it down before I could study it more closely. Ah, that was no mercy. That was as close as that worthless creature would ever get to tasting godhood, and she ripped it away. 
She is the murderer, not I. One day, she shall be punished for it. <sighs> that was her shine hard. They dare to lecture me. Me! Imbeciles! They claim to be from the future, but they fear progress. I performed a miracle of science, and their reaction is to scold me like a child. Damn them. Damn them all. They'll never let me have another subject at this rate. How am I to continue my experiments without subjects? They may let their petty morality hold them back, but I won't let it blind me. Not when I'm this close. I know with certainty now that Edmundium can unlock a species potential. I just have to perfect the process. Even without subjects, I must find a way. I must! Ever since I saw those strange holograms in the island's control center, I considered this possibility in the back of my mind, but I wasn't prepared to confront it. Not directly. The room was similar to the one with the creatures, if much smaller. Specimen tubes lined the walls in neat rows and columns, but these all held the same species. Homo sapiens. They weren't clones, exactly. At least not of each other. Each one was unique, and they were all adults. I suppose I came from somewhere like this too. Designed in that control center, and then created in this factory. Does that mean my memories? They're all transplants? Fake? No, impossible. They're too vivid, too detailed. Maybe, somehow, the station can reach back in time and just copy someone. That seems unlikely, but I think I'll cling to it. It makes me feel more real. At least that way, someone actually lived my life, even if it wasn't me. The human specimen room was hard on everyone, but I think it was the worst for Megan. She's gone completely silent, trudging behind Santiago, acting like an armored zombie. I've tried my best to explain everything and offer my support, but I'm not sure I helped. When I think about it, it's incredible that she's made it this far with her sanity intact. In her time, they were nearly seven centuries away from inventing bloody gunpowder. The idea of a machine that creates human beings and that it created you would be unfathomable. I hope she's all right. For all our sakes, seeing her rattled like this makes me feel a lot less safe. We finally found it! This has to be the obelisk control room. Fortunately, the consoles here were similar to the ones in the control center that I've used before, so I was able to help Santiago get started. He's been working on it for a while now, muttering and cursing to himself the whole time. I can't blame him. This is some baffling shit we've- Huh! No way! He just said he cracked it! It certainly sounded like he did too. There was a loud hum and... Oh! Those are roars! Lots of roars! Time to run then! I'll finish this later! I may not be allowed to collect more test subjects, but I'm not without resources. Rather than use living creatures, I've taken my experiments one step further, and begun testing the effects of Edmundium fusion on human blood. My blood. Thus far, the results are promising. Yes, this is the proper way to do it. Injecting the Edmundium into that creature was too crude. If I first fuse the Edmundium with the subject's blood, then inject the resulting concoction... Yes, that's it. I have it. 
The Edmundium knows it too. It hums its approval as I work. It knows that soon we shall be one. Soon. I too shall ascend. Right as Santiago finished disabling the obelisk, the station unleashed a horde of creatures in self-defense. So Santiago blasted the controls and ran like hell. Fortunately, Mei Yin's battle instinct brought her back to reality just in time, and she led the charge through a throng of fangs and claws, while Santiago and I did what we could as we raced to keep up. Even though Santiago had prepared the platform for a quick getaway, it was a close call. I had to pull him through the portal just before it closed. But in the end, we made it. We're covered in guts and uh, still a bit twitchy, but we made it. <laughs> Struth, what a day. I need a pint and the world's longest nap, stat. You think I'd be more enthused. We saved the village. I confirmed the true nature of these space stations. And when the gateway project is complete, we could actually escape this madness. It's all good news, really. So why am I not thrilled? I tried sketching some of the wildlife we've spotted on the way back to the village, but I stopped halfway through. What's the point? In the desert, I told myself it was a form of self-expression. But is it really? If a machine created me to behave a certain way, am I expressing myself or the will of the machine? I really need that pint. Maybe several. We contacted the village to tell them we succeeded. They were a lot more excited than we were. It was quite raucous, actually. Cheering, applause, and all that. Enough that Santiago almost dropped the radio right out of his hands. Even Mei Yin cracked a smile at that. She's coming around, if slowly. She just needed a bit of space, I think. I'm starting to come to terms with everything myself. Even if my memories are someone else's, or aren't real to begin with. What I've done since I've arrived on these stations was my choice. What I do from now on is my choice. That's who Helena Walker is. I think I'm okay with that. Such power, such beauty. I can feel it within me, growing stronger by the second. Never have I felt so alive. <laughs> it was a risk, of course. My process is not yet perfected, but by cutting off the circulation of my left arm, I was able to contain my metamorphosis within it. Now I can study the results before I undergo my final ascension to godhood. <sighs> I must hurry. Hurry! I cannot hide my arm from these lesser creatures for long, nor can I resist its allure. It is taking all my discipline to not simply ascend right now. Yes, why don't I? I should do it. I deserve it. I... No! Patience! Patience. You've waited so very long. Just wait a little longer. I've gathered as much Edmundium as I dare. The villagers are distracted with their inane celebrations, so thus far, I have moved undetected. <laughs> Imbeciles! What cause could they have for such joy? I've heard mention of Miss Walker, but whatever she has accomplished, it's nothing compared to what I've done. Nothing. <sighs> she is nothing. I'm the true scientist here. The true genius. And soon, I shall prove it. <laughs> yes. Well done, Rockwell. Well done. This Edmundium will be more than enough. With it, 
you shall claim what is rightfully yours. At last. At long last. <laughs> The last preparations have been made. When I set down this pen and begin my final experiment, I shall finally achieve my ultimate goal. I shall at last look down upon the bumblings of mortal men from high above on an Edmundian throne. I, Sir Edmund Rockwell, shall become a god. So on this day, let earth and heaven tremble. Let the rivers of this blessed metal sing a song of triumph that echoes forever throughout the depths of these caverns. Let the unworthy drown despair, for a great doom approaches them, and it shall swallow them whole alongside anyone who dared to mock my name. On this day, on this glorious day, I ascend. got another call from the village, but this one wasn't celebratory. In fact, best we can tell, it was a distress call. Santiago couldn't quite clear up the signal, but it had that sort of tone. We heard Diana's voice, panicked shouts, and someone mentioned Rockwell. Since then we've picked up the pace. Hopefully we can make it back in time to help, and the situation isn't as dangerous as it sounded. If something were to happen to Rockwell? I can't help but feel like it would be my fault for neglecting him. Damn it all. We've got to hurry. Still on the table, right? May, I don't Please. want to go. No, Diana, I love stay you. with me. My love, no, no, no.
come here to challenge me.